this episode, we're going to be talking to light heavyweight amateur Will Simpson. We talked to him about his training at Sheffield City ABC and how he manages work, training and life balance. We're also going to be talking about 30 second maximal sprints. These are the hardest sprints on the Boxing Science Programme where we really push our boxers to the limit. I'm going to take a little clip out of Kickstart Your Conditioning webinar by Alan Ruddock. He'll be explaining the science behind Boxing Science's hardest conditioning drills. And our exercise of the week are Anderson squats. I'll be explaining when and why we use this great exercise to help improve strength. Hello and welcome to episode five. It's been a really exciting week and we've got some big times ahead at Boxing Science. We are launching our new coach education workshops, Ultimate Coaching for Combat Sports. These workshops will involve the Boxing Science team going delivering to you about strength conditioning, fitness training, core training, talking about programming and monitoring the athlete, testing and tapering strategies as well. We're really excited by this so we can come out and meet you and coach you a little bit more so you can get the best out of your career and your athletes as well. Our first date will be in Felton in London on October the 28th and 29th. We've got a brilliant weekend lined up for you and if you're interested in this, there's a link just below this video. It's also very exciting for one of our boxers, Jordan Gill. He's returning to the ring at Doncaster Dome on Saturday after 18 month absence and he's more than ready because in this 18 months he's been training harder than ever. He's been getting better at his skill, his technique and also been working on his fitness and his strength in the boxing science sessions. So a lot of athletes, when they have a long layoff, they'll come back probably a worse version of themselves. Jordan's gonna come back a much better version of uh, the thrill. So it's really exciting. I'm excited to see all the results of the hard work and the commitment and unbelievable dedication that he's shown. Our special feature of the week is a special interview with Will Simpson. Will is a light heavyweight amateur coming out of the Sheffield City ABC gym. I've known Will for, uh, it's coming up to three years now, where he uh, made the sacrifice to move from his hometown of Harrogate down to Sheffield to uh, make his boxing career better. Um, you hear about this. Uh, about professionals going away and uh, moving to somewhere where they think that they're going to improve uh, but you don't really hear too many amateurs doing it. When Will turned up to Brendan's gym it, it was quite surprising and you know his level of uh, dedication and commitment was really high. When he came onto the boxing science program you know, Will were uh, quite a skinny kid uh, not that strong, he'll tell you himself uh, he weren't able to do one pull up and now he's been able to do uh, pull ups for reps with the weight attached to his legs. So, uh, you know, he's our top sprinter on the curve, hit 31 kilometers an hour uh, last season, uh, broke our curve records, which is still standing today. And his hard work has paid off because he became Yorkshire uh, champion, ABA Yorkshire champion and he picked up the Northern Area belt. So we managed to catch up with Will in his pre-season training and after, just after his third session of the day. And we had managed to have a chat, uh, to talk about his recent training and how he balances work as well with his training because he also works over 30 hours a week uh, waitering. And I, I thought this is a really good thing to talk about where a lot of boxers are trying to manage their work the life and, and the training balance as well. And it was good to chat to Will because he seems to be the busiest out of our, all of our boxers in terms of how much he works and how much he trains as well.
Okay, we're here with Will Simpson. Just finished a tough session down Sheffield City ABC. How are you doing, Will? Yeah, I'm alright. Okay, <laughs> you're alright. A bit tired. Only a little bit. Yeah. So tell little. tell us what what you've done today. So uh, up at six this morning. Got down for S and C. Good hard session, doing the uh, condition weights, and then getting on the curve and doing our sprints. Took about an hour break, had some uh, food, got refuelled and then came back to the gym to do some technique work on the bags and the pads and stuff. Uh, been at work all day and then I've come straight back here, had a good session of sparring, hence why I look like I just stepped out of the shower. Yeah. So we're down at Sheffield City ABC, great gym for local boxers but you're not actually from Moundy are you? You come down from Harrogate. Yeah, um, it all started for me up in Harrogate where I was born and stuff, uh, 13 years old, just decided I wanted to be a boxer, short kid out of shape and all that, mm. and just put in the graft, took me years, I wasn't very talented at the start, yeah. just worked hard, and then uh, 17, had my first match, about five years later, decided there's only one way for me to improve and that was to come here, yeah. and in all honesty, can't. Don't ever want to look back. Yeah. The Yorkshire title, won the North of England title, won the ABA Yorkshire title. Yeah. And this year, let's go for the national one. Really successful times then in Sheffield. So, what is the secret of success down at Sheffield City ABC? We don't want to give too much. <laughs> don't want to give too much away. But what what have you benefited so much from from Brendan's guidance and obviously the other coaches that are down here? I think the best quality our gym has is patience. Okay. We're all here for one another. Brendan, you could do a thousand things wrong a thousand times in a row mm -hmm. and he won't lose his patience. He'll just stand there and say, come on, let's go again. Yeah. This is what you're doing wrong. Let's get back on it. And that's the sort of thing I needed because I'm a slow learner yeah. and he put time into me and I appreciate it and I want to show that when I get in the ring. You know, I want to show the time he's put into me. It's been Fantastic since he's been here, he's, he's always been here all his life <laughs> at uh, Fall at Furniture. But no, yeah. good kid, great season last season. Uh, he's looking to build on that and have a better season this season. Uh, some adjustments, like you say, you know, he's an amateur boxer. Um, but the, mark, the time and effort that he puts into it, he probably puts into it more than some professionals. Uh, but he's got to earn a living, he's got, he's got a job, he works different shifts, so we've had to, you know, change his training around that to suit him but uh, yeah he's 100 percent will horse gives you 100 percent oh yeah I'm looking for a good season off will boxing in uh, september 22nd defends his yorkshire belt and then uh, onwards and upwards from there definitely so you was up at six o'clock this morning doing your snc training down at boxing science how's that working for you are you feeling much stronger and fitter just put it this way when i start i couldn't do a single pull up yeah <laughs> Yeah. I can do them with weights hanging off of my legs. I can run faster and harder than I ever have. My fitness is through the roof. I'm stronger, hit harder. My weight's better. My my dieting's better. I eat better than I've ever done. You know, it's at the end of the day, it all comes down to who's willing to try the hardest. But you know, as long as you're willing to try hard, they'll guide you in the right direction. You've done three sessions today, and you've worked in between. Yeah. So, so what happens in, in your working life and how does that make it hard for you to balance between work, life and training? Well, I'm a waiter at a botanist restaurant and in all honesty it's a good laugh. It's yeah. a very good laugh. The thing about it is it is high intensity work. Mm. It sounds silly saying running yeah. plates and stuff is high intensity but when yeah, the definitely. kitchen's down two flights of stairs and mm. you're having to run up and down them every 30 seconds, you, you work on quite a sweat. And, uh, yeah. You know, people don't realise how much of a strain it is to follow your passion mm. while paying the bills. Yeah. So credit to anyone that does it, it's hard yeah. work. Well, well, credit to you. So obviously you've got to look after your diet and yeah. your recovery. Absolutely, yeah. you know, fitting meals in between, sneaking into the into the bar back room and uh, just eating little snacks and stuff that yeah. the manager doesn't see me taking this. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously it's very commendable what you're doing, but there's a lot of boxers that are doing this at the minute and probably finding it hard to train even once a day and you're training three times a day so what kind of advice would you give to any boxers watching this that are struggling to get that work life balance and training balance if it means that much to you yeah 
if you don't have time, you make time. Yeah. And if you're missing out because you're having a late night and not having any sleep, then stop messing around. Yeah. If you want to train and you want to succeed, go to bed early, get up early, train your heart out, do your work, rest in between if you can. Whatever time you've got, you've got to dedicate it to what you want. Yeah. And this is what I want and this is why I do it. Yeah, and the proof is in the pudding with your success. Yorkshire champion, Northern Area champion. Since uh, the English champion. Since the English champion. So there you go. How did you feel like getting them getting them titles? Uh, you know, if you ever go back to the video of me winning the Yorkshire title the first time, I actually cried. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, like I say, I wasn't talented when I started and I lost a lot of fights. Mm. And for me, that, that showed if you don't give up, you get where you want to be. Yeah. You've just got to keep trying. And that's, again, credit to Brendan for having the patience to bring me on. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to win it if I hadn't I've developed the way I have. Mm. Fantastic. Cheers for your time, Will. So our topic of the week are the 30-second maximal sprints. Now, we talk about this quite a lot because we find that this protocol is real bang for your buck, getting the best adaptations in the shortest amount of time. Now our box has got a real love-hate relationship with 30 second maximal sprints because it hurts, really really hurts and you can't find a comfortable position to sit in or lay in or whatever in between reps and it really pushes your body to the max. But on the other hand, they see massive benefits to their performance. In our recent combat conditioning conference, Alan Ruddock explains the physiology behind these sprints, you know, what it's actually doing to the body and why it's so beneficial as well. So take a look. So what is it? Well, we define sprint intervals and sprints specifically as short duration maximum efforts. For us, it doesn't really matter, you know, if you're running at a particular speed or 100% of your actual sprint running speed. What matters is effort that you're putting in for us it's short duration maximum efforts and because we're focused on effort it means that anyone can do our programs it doesn't matter how fast you can run as long as you can put in max effort which everyone should be able to do anyone can do our programs when we say short duration what do we mean well a sprint interval for us is defined as anything lasting up to 30 seconds and we found that anything that's greater than 30 seconds tends to compromise the quality of the session because it, it decreases the average, the mean average speed that you can produce over an interval and that has an interaction with the, the physiological responses that you'll be eliciting by doing that type of sprint. So anything up to 30 seconds we deem to be short duration, anything above that and you're tending to get away from a sprint interval. So recovery time or rest time is also crucial, but what should you be doing during recovery? Well, in the previous slide, I said that these are maximum efforts. Okay, so in the first two minutes of recovery, you shouldn't be able to do anything because what you've done previously is a 30 second flat out max effort. So if I'm being honest, you should be writhing in pain. And if you're not writhing in pain, you haven't put max effort in for 30 seconds. Okay, there should not be a position that is comfortable. You should be on the floor, breathing heavy and thinking what the hell has just gone on. And then in the remaining one minute of recovery, you should then start focusing on your breathing, walking around, clearing your head and focusing it on the next interval. So our sprints and recovery times are best illustrated in this video of the champ, Kel Brook. <laughs> So that was the effect of one of our sprint interval trainings on Kel Brook. Um, as you can see, there is no position that looks comfortable. You know, he's put maximum effort in in all of his repetitions. Um, the session that we're going to give to you today in this presentation is the same session that did that to Kel Brook.
So why do we use sprint intervals? You know, what what is it that's so special? Why have we chosen sprint interval trainings to kickstart your conditioning? Well, there are a few key questions that we always try and ask ourselves, and that's for me as a physiologist that who's interested in how the body responds and adapts to exercise, I'm interested in what does sprint intervals do to the body during a training session? And then what does it do if we keep repeating these sessions? What does it do over a longer period of time if we keep doing it? Does it induce favourable adaptations that contribute to boxing performance? Or is it just, you know, getting us fit in a random way just a little bit? You know, and, and how long do these adaptations take to have a meaningful performance improvement? You know, all of these questions we've answered for you and they're pretty difficult questions to ask and there isn't really a clear answer for any one of them. Um, so we're kind of integrating several different answers from several different different areas and we've tried and tested these methods and these are the reasons why we use sprint intervals. So like all our training systems and our training sessions, we start with the scientific research. What does the research say and what does it say about sprint interval training? So we know that it places a large demand on our muscle cells to produce energy. And when it does so, it causes strain and that strain is directly related to adaptation. So our muscle cells are being depleted of energy and that's causing signals for adaptation. So when we do this time and time again over rep to rep and session to session, it improves our ability to utilise oxygen. And this improved ability to utilise oxygen doesn't just help conditioning, it also helps strength training as well and it also helps boxing specific training. We've seen beneficial adaptations occur in as little as six sessions. We prefer nine because we've seen consistent adaptations over nine sessions, but we know the research has also observed beneficial adaptations within six sessions. But like I say, nine sessions provides a bit more of a consistent adaptation profile. The week. The exercise of the week are Anderson squats. These are squats that start from the pins. You can either start from a half squat position or right down into a full squat position. When the bar is on the rack, it takes away the stretch shortening cycle. This means that it's really concentrating on concentric force, the same way as what a deadlift would. So really focusing on acceleration and starting strength. This can have huge positive effects on the rate of force development. So starting from, uh, I'd say like, a three quarter or half squat position can be great because basically more weight can be lifted. This can overload the core and the legs and get the boxers lifting more weight and getting used to lifting more weight for when they go into their main training blocks. So it's overloading them, preparing them to lift heavier weights in the full rep versions. And starting from this position, the core needs to be really, really tense. The fact that the core is under so much tension will improve core mass and core strength. And we know that this is really beneficial to a punch. And taking away the stretch shortening cycle, you can end up lifting more weight. And it seems weird because the stretch shortening cycle is really beneficial to a squat, but it takes a lot of technique and it takes a lot of time to try and build that. We've got boxers that are more explosive than they are strong. They're not able to um, kind of control their me-centric forces and use that stretch shortening cycle effectively. And plus, the squat technique needs developing. So the fact that they come from this uh, kind of training history, this training situation, and squat can get them in a better position to, and to concentrate on concentric force, this will help them lift more weight and get stronger as well. And takes away the limitation. Also, this reduces the amount of eccentric load on a squat. And reducing that will reduce the amount of muscle soreness that your boxer might experience. Now, this is really important because uh, a boxer is often in a negative energy state, so won't be able to have the foods to 
refuel and reduce muscle damage. So squats can sometimes leave a boxer feeling very sore or tired uh, into their normal training. An Anderson squat reduces that eccentric load, but we can get strength adaptations and reduce DOMS at the same time, which means that our training is going to be more effective without being detrimental to their boxing performance. So when would we use Anderson squats? The main reasons to use Anderson squats is to overload. So at the minute, we're using it with Callum and Will and a few other boxers on our group sessions because their next training block will be maximal strength. So we're wanting them to overload, have an intense training block where they're lifting more weight than what they're used to on normal squats. And then basically what they'll do, they'll transition to full squat and they should be able to lift more weight. So they're gonna get more out of their training. Another area where I've used it is when boxer is going through some heavy sparring. So like I said before, uh, the Anderson squat helps us massively in improving strength and reducing muscle soreness at the same time. So this is really good to keep up our strength levels uh, without affecting our sparring session. And we're using this with Anthony Fowler at the moment and we're seeing really good strength gains in the gym and we're seeing good performances in sparring as well. So now I'm going to demonstrate how to do an Anderson squat. So now I'm going to demonstrate how to do an Anderson squat. First of all, we've got to set up the pins in an appropriate position. Uh, for me, I'm just going to go a little bit lower than a half squat. Uh, and it might take a little bit of playing about, so don't load the bar up too much before you set up. And if you're doing it for the first time, it's going to be quite hard to get into this position. It's quite a stressful position to start off from. So if you're starting uh, to use Anderson squats for the first time, I'd start a little bit higher, like say a half squat, or just a little bit below a half squat before you go all the way down into the deep position. So first of all, I'm going to get my hands a little bit wider than what I'd normally get a normal squat in, just because if you've got tight shoulders, starting from this position and getting down straight away, it's going to be a little bit difficult. So I have my hands a little bit wider, and I'm going to scoop under, and plant my feet shoulder width apart. It's important to push your knees out, keep your chest up, deep breath in, and explode. So a difficult part of this lift is the first rep because you haven't got that momentum there. So the first rep is always going to be quite difficult. So always encourage your athlete to be pushing up through the ground so they're using their legs. Another uh, common mistake is because it requires a lot of core tension that they don't tense up enough at the start or they start to use their backs. So like I said, just encourage that core tension to start, deep breath in, and encourage them to push through the floor. Another common mistake that athletes make is when they're actually pushing through and finishing the rep, they finish quite shallow. Because they're not starting in this uh, position, they don't get used to thrusting their hips through. So what I find when people are doing Anderson squats is when they push up, it's really quad dominant, and finish in a position like this where this length slightly forward and not fully extending the hips. So what you need to encourage is when they're firing up from this position is that they're getting the hips in straight away. I'll show you a quick example of how I punch my hips forward on Anderson squat. So if you're going to give Anderson squats a go, here's my main tips. Start off a little bit higher, so either in a half squat or just underneath the half squat position and then start working your way down. You're going to find yourself that you're going to be able to lift a little bit more weight than what you normally do on a back squat. I'd say 
Let's go under what you normally back squat or try and match it to start off with because if you go too much too soon uh, it might be a little bit too much load for your spine and for your core to handle. So try and um, at the most match the squat, uh, that, what you use to, and then build up from there. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to uh, click the subscribe button below and you can see all our future posts on Boxing Science TV and I'll catch you next week.